Hello everyone and welcome back to Active Inference Insights. I'm your host, Darius Parvizi Wayne, and today I feel extremely lucky to be able to interview two exceptional researchers. Dr. Michael Levin is a distinguished professor of biology at Tufts University, serving as director of the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts and the Tufts Center for Regenerative and Developmental Biology. His lab studies anatomical and behavioral decision-making at multiple scales of biological, artificial, and hybrid systems. Franz Kuckling is Mike's postdoc at Tufts with a special interest in the physics of life and how cells adapt to changes in their physical environment. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure and an honor. Um, you're kind of, you know, everyone in Active Inference has a foray into theoretical biology, but I would say you guys are the first out and out biologists that we've had on the show. So I'm super excited to learn. Um, but you may have to excuse some of my more layman ideas that come from the, the British schooling system. Where I wanted to start is probably just putting in some groundwork for the audience uh, who might be unaware of certain terms that get used in, in the papers that you guys write. I wanted to start with morphogenesis. What is morphogenesis? And in what kind of, sp you talk about morphospace, what is morphospace and, and how do those two things relate? Yeah. I don't well, know who wants all, to take it. Um, I, I guess I can, I'll, I'll start and, and then Franz can uh, give his view. Um, so so thanks for having us. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here and to talk to you. Um, uh, there, there's, a, there's a fundamental fact of biology, which is that uh, complex shape and, and functional structure are self-assembled. So uh, let's just think about embryonic development. We all start life as a single cell, and eventually that single cell has to give rise to a, a, a complex organism of different types. And so this not only during development, but also during regeneration. So for example, a salamander loses a limb. Those cells have to not only uh, restore the entire structure, but then also know to stop when it's done. OK, and uh, there are other examples of this, of course, metamorphosis so when the you know, caterpillar gets to a butterfly or, or something like that. So there, there are numerous examples where the biological the hardware is, uh, is, is basically reconstructing itself. And so this is broadly conceived. This is the notion of morphogenesis. Now, one way to look at this is as a sort of open loop process, meaning that there are uh, a, a set of rules that are executed in parallel. So um, lots of um, molecule cells and so on are, are following these rules. And then uh, there's a process of emergence and something complex comes out the other end. You know, this is the standard story of cellular automata or other ways to think about emergent complexity. And that's true. I mean, that does happen. And then it's certainly part of the story. But the more interesting part of the story is that Morphogenesis, whether developmental, regenerative, or in the context of cancer suppression or remodeling, any of those kinds of um, examples, one of the amazing things that it can do is get to its uh, get to its target morphology despite various perturbations. So, if you want to dig in, I'll give you I can give you all kinds of interesting examples where not only the environment changes, not only injury, but actually the components themselves, the the amount of DNA, the type of DNA, the number of cells, the size of cells, all of these things can change. And certain morphogenetic systems are amazing at getting where they're going despite all of these things. In fact, they will often take um, novel paths to do it, which is uh, William James's definition of intelligence, right? Same goal by different means. So um, one way to, so, 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 then, so then the question is, what, what conceptual tools can we bring to bear to understand this process? Uh, and what we have settled on, or, or at least what, what we've been, we've been uh, pursuing for the last uh, some, some years, is this idea of navigation. That what's actually happening here is that you have a collective intelligence. It's basically a set of uh, processes um, hierarchically organized from molecules to cells to tissues and so on. And what they're all doing is navigating the space of all possible outcomes. So there's a, there's a huge um, uh, you know, uh, space of, of diverse morphologies that they can achieve. And what they're doing is like any agent navigating its environment, they are, they are trying to get to where they're going. And sometimes they have interesting competencies to do it even when things go wrong. So now we can bring to bear all of the tools of behavior science, of, of uh, control theory, all this, you know, cybernetics, all this stuff that's used to design um, autonomous vehicles, you know, all of these kinds of things to ask, how does the system know where it is? How does it remember where it's going and uh, what competencies does it have to get there? So that's, that's, that's why we use the notion of morphospace because it allows us to make testable specific hypotheses about the policies that, that are involved in this process. Wonderful. That's a, that's a really nice background from which we can kind of explore these ideas. Yeah, it, it seems when you put it that way, very consonant with the ideas of active inference. 
which is obviously something that you guys have, have written about before. So Franz, maybe I'll come to you now. You, there's this idea in these... So, so people think of priors in sort of statistical space or more broadly about the organism as a whole. You know, what are the priors of the organism to be well-fed, to eat, and so on. But we could also talk about a cell's prior or an a cell's posterior and Bayesian unfolding, Bayesian processes within the cell. What in this idea of navigation and self-organization, what would you say the cell's prior is? Is it purely to reach a kind of target morphology or is there anything more than that? I would say there's a lot more than that, but that's the most, um, the, the simplest to kind of formulate because morphospace, like Mike was um, explaining, is something that we, we have much more access to as a development of biologist, right? So the, the challenge is you can formulate all kinds of priors and belief expectations for a cell, but if you have no way to estimating how that's even being achieved, then that's hard to really um, put in any theory that, that's you know experimentally accessible. But from one thing kind of to point out that the idea of a morphospace or cells navigating uh, spaces is, is only challenging for, for people that are not in, in, involved in this field because we are so used in spatial dimension mm. as that being the space, right? But you can assign all kinds of dimensions to a, to a cell. We do this for humans all the time. You know, the idea of, of characters in a, in a plot being multidimensional is something that is very much applicable to cells as well. So to ask uh, to answer your question more succinctly, so what, what happens in terms of expectations of a cell that might have, you have to really go into what is it constantly achieving has any relevance for future states. So that's a lot of this can be transcriptional states. So what kind of genes are being expressed at any point in time? And that is being informed not just by the by the structure of the DNA, so by millions of years of evolution. It's also being informed by past um, events, not just in, in that individual cell, but in its parent cells and, and, and going on. So that's what we call the epigenetic landscape. So which genes are actually even accessible for the transcription machinery and which genes are being activated to really transcribe and make certain proteins down the line. And so that really is something where, where a lot of the prior expectations are going into um, that we, at least now in the lab, are really investigating of what kind of transcription profiles do we see, but then also mm -hmm. uh, in terms of its, its transmembrane potential, you know, and the, whether that studies the bioelectric potentials a lot. That's something that of course, for neuroscience, much more familiar. We talk a lot about action potentials. We don't have mm. those in, in, in non-neuronal cells, but every cell has a has a memory potential, electric potential, and those are informative and they are um, causing a lot of downstream events so we can get more down to the online. But that's part of what I think is um, part of the prior belief and expectations that a cell is constantly um, having. Excellent. Yeah, um, I think there's a really important point there, which is kind of something that I noticed reading your papers which is a uh, morphogenesis the, the the very idea of physical space seems to be prioritized um it's self-organization in space is that the only way I, just in terms of conceptualization is that the only way that we could think of a cell you know reaching a posterior that aligns with its prior <laughs> does it have to be in accordance with some kind of self-organization in space or is there another way that a cell could kind of reach a homeostatic set point I'm not absolutely sure. yeah Go ahead. it doesn't have to be just space right so um even if you have the cell just somewhere in the body already differentiated already kind of mm. has its, its target morphology achieved it has to maintain that morphology first of all but then also it has to perform a certain function right your kidney yeah. cells your know, liver cells they are very different functions even though they're all fixed in space and physical space so prior beliefs are you know in this case for example for a kidney cell is what kind of um what kind of um changes in the blood are being uh, am I being exposed to parts in the liver same thing um if you have cells in in the brain then why it's different they are, I have expectations about action potentials so um it that space right and, and again morpho space isn't just um spatial dimension right yeah. it's also it's also traversing because every, every cell in your body this is an important point every cell in your body has exact same DNA more or less right but what's actually being expressed, that's the, the, the difference between all of them. So they are vastly different in the actual proteins, but also in the genes that are being expressed constantly. So when we say traversing and navigating the morphospace, we really talk a lot, not just about the physical space, but how are they changing, which genes are being expressed, which genes are being turned on and off, which really makes the cell identity in the end. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's absolutely really, really useful to integrate function and space there. And I guess those two, they, they feel to me inextricable. But actually, perhaps I'm wrong there, Mike. Is it 
how so so reading kind of the active inference account of morphogenesis we talk about the external states of the markov blanket for a cell being other cells and in the case of developmental processes you know, it turns they end up being other specific type of cells that they then join together with in morphospace is that how how necessary is the presence of specific other cells in the bayesian unfolding for a particular cell or could you imagine that a cell's prior might be confirmed you know absent a specific collection of external cells yeah i mean this is this is a great question and it's it's part of a very emerging research program because it really isn't <clears throat> super clear uh yet uh what precisely cells are paying attention to and and what their internal models of the outside world are what we do know is that in for example let's just take let's just take early development so you have a blastoderm and there are i don't know fifty thousand cells there and at some point we as as, as external observers will look at that and we'll say well there's an embryo there's one embryo well what is there one of right and and if you if you want to think about an embryo the thing you're really counting when you say one is you're counting the fact that all of the cells have bought into the same picture of the outside world and what their goal is. So, so they are all going to cooperate to build a particular thing. What binds them together into being one larger scale emergent individual is commitment to a particular model of, of where, where they, um, where they belong, where the boundary is between them and, and some other embryo, because you can, you can make by putting in little, little scratches into that blastoderm, you can make twins, triplets, you know, there are multiple individuals that can come from that blastoderm. So every cell um, has to be part of some in, in that scenario has to be part of some network and that network has to make decisions about where it ends and where the outside world begins, because that has to do with size control and, and, uh, you know, left, right asymmetry and all kinds of things. So, uh, it's really critical to understand what exactly um, the, the cells are paying attention to, what exactly the uh, tissue is paying attention to, so the cell network, because I actually think that there are, uh, there are agents here at every level. So even actually, even to take a step back, you know, um, even molecular networks within cells, I don't even think you have to get to the, to the level of a cell before you can start talking about um, beliefs and, and expectations and so on. Because as we see, even gene regulatory networks can learn from experience. They, uh, they can do so something like five or six different kinds of learning, including Pavlovian conditioning. And so you can, you can ask that question about what does the world look like from the perspective of a gene regulatory network before it's been trained or after it's been trained and, and so on, right? So this is all, of course, very, very active uh, areas of investigation still so we don't know all the answers but but I think I think it's very important to start taking the perspective of the things that we are modeling and asking what do they see and what what are they measuring what are they paying attention to how do they remap information into uh, salient um, compressions for them you know and 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 how that affects decision making and so on how does that then um, integrate with a kind of idea of telos or teleonomy um, because you know the way you know, if we take the perspective of a cell or a collection of cells that are parametricizing beliefs over external states, it sounds purposive. It sounds like, as you say, there's agency there, um, and even the word beliefs people associate with propositional philosophical beliefs. How far should we take that metaphor literally? Well, okay. So, so the first thing I would say about that is just as kind of a ground uh, ground rules. I, I don't believe in the dichotomy of literally versus metaphorically. Okay. I think all we have in science is metaphor and, and, and uh, what, what, you know, when people talk about molecular pathways, I mean, talk about a metaphor, right? The pathway re relative to what's actually going. I mean, this is completely metaphorical. So all of, all of these things are metaphors. The real, the real question of course, is what set of tools does that metaphor give you to make progress? What does it help you discover? What does it facilitate? So uh, to me, all of this is it gets settled empirically to the to the uh, to the point that uh, if if you have a particular metaphor, so maybe you talk about cells as having beliefs, or maybe you don't. And the real question is, what does that worldview allow you to do? Now, I think that's the final judge of it. I don't I don't uh, really put a lot of weight into sort of philosophical pre commitments about what what goals and beliefs have to be. It's a question of portability of tools. So um, I, I now now having said that, so so I think that. Uh, these kind of um, uh, these kind of tools are extremely useful, and 
they're again not binary because even even as early as the 40s already uh, uh wiener rosenbluth and bigelow gave us a um kind of a, a scale of different types of different goals of different complexity right so it's so a very simple kinds of uh, passive matter and then active matter and then and their homeostat various kinds of homeostats and second order metacognition and so you can you can sort of go up and up and and it's an empirical question which of these are the most useful for any of the contexts that you study but i think it is uh it is absolutely reasonable to see all of these things as having some position on that scale and you know it's important to say that back back before i don't know let's let's say before the 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 the, the 30s and 40s there was a the the problem the problem with the teleology was that uh we, we didn't have a way of thinking about machines with goals we sort of m most people would assume that that humans have goals but other than that we really had no idea how to cash that out but but it's it's really critical to to say that we're past that now we we have a good rigorous science of uh, what it means for for mechanisms to have goals it's fine it's not magical anymore we don't have to be be, be afraid of it and um and so uh i, I guess the last thing i want to say is the difference between teleology and teleonomy so um the def one definition of teleonomy is apparent goal directedness okay apparent teleology and a lot of times people use that as a kind of um as a hedge as a way of softening the concept they say well look it's not real teleology it just looks like teleology you know and and that's a way so so we don't have to really um uh, commit to be to being teleologists we're just going to say it just looks that way so so i like the word teleonomy but for the opposite reason i i am not trying to soften the concept i'm i, I i'm you know not in, in in no way uh um kind of uh hesitant about using teleology i think it absolutely works what i think is uh useful about the concept of teleonomy is that by putting the word apparent in there what it does is it focuses on an observer's point of view apparent to whom and i think that is a really critical question to ask in almost all of the stuff that that we talk about here which is not some some sort of objective uh, uh, universal uh, truth about these things, but from the perspective of some particular observer, now that might be a human scientist, that might be a parasite, that might be a subcomponent of the system, that might be some sort of super set of the system, that might be the system itself, right? We all, you know, systems observe themselves too. And so, so, so what that says is that there is, there is some perspective from which the system acts as a goal directed agent and thus that could and then can be can be used uh, with uh, tools that belong to that so um that's that's what you know that's that's what i think is the, the most useful term of uh, the sense of teleonomy yeah franz i was wondering what you thought about this because um i think it's a natural inclination maybe it's a romantic fiction that we want to ascribe some telos to smaller let's say or, or less complex entities like cells or processes within cells there's an interesting thing that, that uh, mike said that i wanted to pick up on which is that basically everything in science is a metaphor i guess where i might slightly push back on that is the science of lived experience um and phenomenology which we can't help we have to take in some ways literally because it's the one thing that we're intimately aware of and there's a lovely paper by anthony jack and andreas ropestorff ages ago 2002 i think where they argue that basically you can take sort of every psychological construct and say, well, every, every the way that we co um, you know coalesce on what attention means or memory means really is because of what we how we experience it. So, I was wondering whether there's a kind of uh, tie there. I mean, or an association between when we talk about a cell's beliefs, a cell's attention, a cell's memory. Is there any way we can think of that without bringing in our own phenomenal experience? It's tough. I mean, um, like, especially initially when I earlier in my in my research when I you know wasn't as deep into a lot of the, the the metaphysics behind it and all that, I tried to really avoid it and I tried to really focus the my audience on on just the, the mechanical aspects, the mechanistic aspects, you know, the cellular aspects. But I find that it was almost impossible to do that because all the words we use are so loaded with everything mm. we have from psychology. Um, but that being said, nowadays um, I I think a really the important part is to do to to do that transversion that the, transversing those two um fields in both ways because the 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 claim we're making i think is not that it, like a cell is doing the same thing on the same level on the same scale like you know mike really mentioned right there's a there's a certain gradient there as a as a human being is but we're trying to understand where the origin of all these phenomena are coming from and are there and, and more importantly are there fundamental principles shared between a cell and uh, 
and mm. uh, into a more classical active representation like a human being. So things like beliefs, right? So when you say that it's always a belief, people are like, oh, well, you're talking about, you know, um, have lit- religious beliefs, <laughs> and then you get really fast trapped into into these loopholes. But I nowadays try to counter this argument by saying, well, what is a belief, and like, where does it come from? It can't just, it, it has to, in a, in a human being, has to come from certain expectations, right? So you really have to then go down to how do, how do you, once you have to define it, you have to then go to some mathematical frameworks eventually, otherwise. Mm. It's, have to develop it and so active inference is nice because there you have very precise definitions of what a belief actually is yeah and so once the kind of trick you can do is can people well so okay let's talk about active inference human being you, you make a certain process you know you have a general model general process you define the mark of blankets so separation between what's outside that you can't see and then yourself so an internal state and then you have the separation of those two by the active and sensory inputs you can get right you, you have sensory inputs and then you can act upon the environment to change what those sensory inputs, your eyes, your ears, are, are perceiving over time. And that's actually what agency really is about. It's about controlling. You can't really control the environment if you can't perceive it. What you're actually controlling is how you perceive the environment. But of course, you're doing that by acting on the environment. That's what agency is. Sure. Now, once you put it in such a formalistic framework, then the, I think transferring that to cells becomes much more, much more easier and lot, much less um, controversial. I think. Yeah, I, I I sense that that sort of um less philosophically laden more deflationary account of agency is is definitely possible it, it's just control in line with prior expectations or, or uh, you know self-organization principles of self-organization i think one thing that perhaps active inference also hasn't got very clear on but certainly isn't clear in psychology is selfhood and in some ways i feel like it's very fundamental to this question of morphogenesis and self-organization <clears throat> in biological space because it's morphogenesis for who right so mike you sort of noted that in many ways well we're talking about that we have it's all observer relative but also in some ways it's also internal relative because they are man of you know they are self-organizing for the sake of their own integrity so well again that might be ascribing a telos that's unwarranted but it, it, it could be described like that um what is biological selfhood and i guess for people who think of the self as one monolithic thing how does it how does it be how can it be distinguished from more complex forms of selfhood like metacognitive selfhood or epistemic selfhood and so on um i think that uh you know the the issue of morphogenesis for whom is actually really important uh because you know a a a really defective a frog embryo might be a very nice zebrafish embryo and so this whole right, and, and so and so this whole notion of you know mu- mutation and uh, and just just in general evolutionary change and what what exactly is a birth defect is really important and interesting. Ch- chemistry doesn't make mistakes, so there's no such thing as as a mistake in chemistry. But there is potentially a mistake in carrying out developmental biology, depending on what perspective you're looking at. So it's something very interesting. It's you know the the ability to make mistakes is a hallmark of a cognitive system. Right, because because that suggests that you had certain expectations that were not met, and so on. So, just the very nature of a of a birth defect is is interesting. So now now um, the notion of a self, uh, I, of course, there are many ways to think about it. I'll I'll give you what how how I've been thinking about it. Um, what, one of the things that that I really wanted to do uh, for early on is to come up with a framework uh, to directly think of and compare uh, think about and compare agents of very diverse structure and provenance so we're talking about you know conventional beings like like us and animals i mean also those are also co- of course collective intelligences right we're all made of cells and so on but also you know new synthetic things that are going to be created um uh, robots ai hybrids hybrids cyborgs you know all kinds of mixed uh, kinds of uh, things uh, p- potential exobiological life and so on what what do they all have in common Common. You know, what, what do all agents have in common, no matter w- how they're made and no matter how they got here, you know, what their origin story is. So what, what I settled on, and, and so now you see, you know, I'm super into the whole uh, teleology thing. So, so what I settled on is this notion of um, the size of their goals. 
In other words, uh, I, I define this notion of a cognitive light cone, which is um, it's not the distance that you can sense or act. It's the size of the goals that you're able to maintain. The biggest goal that you could possibly maintain is the size of your cognitive light cone. So, you know, so, so every, every agent has some degree of memory going backwards, maybe large, maybe small, some predictive power forward, and some spatial area of concern over which its goals play out. And, um, and so, so now, now the thing about that is that that is the, the determination of a cognitive light cone by an observer. For example, here, you as a scientist are given a new system. You don't really know how it works and you want to do some behavioral experiments and you find out that here are the things that it can possibly care about. That, that is a, a third person investigation of its agency. And we say this is an agent. To, what, what I think of as a useful definition of the self is exactly that process in first person. So a self is what, how that process plays out for the system itself. So the system itself also has to be able to coarse grain the outside world and not only tell agential stories about um, things in its environment that do things, right? Because no, no system can afford to, to track microstates. You know, Laplace's demon isn't gonna, you know, you'll be eaten and, and dead long before you calculate anything. So, so every, every agent in the real world has to, has to coarse grain and they, they tell these stories about, you know, agents, other agents doing things. But you also have to tell that story about yourself to some extent. You, you can't avoid it because if you don't have a compact uh, self model, you are not going to be very good at controlling your own parts and making things happen. It's just right. That's just part of being effective in the real world. And so I think what we say when we um, what we mean when we say self is the internal first person view of a system about its own. Right. So 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 you so so there's kind of a bundle of things you need to have. You need to. You need to have a sense of boundary between you and the outside world. So which are the things that I think are actually me versus versus not me? You need to have some uh, representation of some space that you think you're operating in. You need to have some sense of your own sensors and effectors. What, what can I actually do? What am I actually sensing? And so on. We as third person observer scientists uh, try to tell those stories about other things that we work with, but, but the agents tell them about themselves. And so do, para, you know, parasites and conspecifics and various, you know, potential mates and prey and cheaters and, and all of these things, everybody's hacking everybody else. And in order to hack other, other agents, to hack yourself and your own parts, to have control over your own parts requires that sense of selfhood. And it might be, you know, as, as Franz said, the point isn't to say that every rock has human level hopes and dreams. That isn't the point. The point is that, uh, there are, there's a huge range in how much processing is, how much sort of meta processing is done about all of this. You know, you can, you can roll all this forward in a, in a very kind of minimal way, or you can have all kinds of loops where you're actually monitoring your own progress on certain goals and you have the ability to change your goals and to pick new goals. I mean, there's a, you know, you can layer stuff on and on, but. That's yeah, that's really great. That's a really lovely explanation. Yeah, it, it really deeply aligns with the way that I think about selfhood, which is fundamentally from a sort of Metzingerian um, phenomenal self modeling aspect. And that's exactly what Thomas would say, which is that self modeling is the capacity to recapitulate or re-simulate the actual data structures of your own body in a kind of coarse grained space. Mm. So it's, you know, the, the one thing that came to mind is talking about the uh, cognitive light cone is in terms of the the extent of your goal, yes, it's in space, but it's also in time. Mm -hmm. And that feels like a very relevant thing here. Um, when I've spoken to Carl and, and when I've seen the direction of active inference, it's very much going in time, to, uh, in, in you know, the direction of temporal planning, deep temporal planning, which arguably relates to the depth of your generative hierarchy because the, the deeper your generative hierarchy, you know, the, the, the highest level is going to be tracking the most invariant and long-term fluctuations in the external environment so friends i'm just curious if you're i mean this is just a thought experiment is there a way where perhaps if you have a, a cyborg or a tadpole or you know some entity that you're examining and you're trying to get to the, its cognitive infrastructure is looking i don't know whether this would be behaviorally or anatomically is looking at its capacity for planning which might well just be it's the depth of its generative hierarchy does that give us an insight into its actual you know, existential or, or experiential life? I think it does. And it relates back to the your early question about what are its actual beliefs, you know, what on what level are, are its beliefs being expressed? And so I just gave you a couple of examples. What I've left out is, you know, that, of course, like you just said, what's important is the hierarchy of that. How are these different different beliefs 
organized in a certain hierarchy of, of spatial and temporal scale. And also to, to I really like that point Mike made earlier about chemistry not making mistakes, right? So what that means is the conclusion of that idea is that any purely chemical system is not going to change much. It's not going to be entirely predictable. It's not going to push back on anything in the environment. It's just going to have a certain, it's going to come to an equilibrium pretty, pretty fast usually, and then that, that's it. And so another way to form this question of how does a cell, how can we um, test agency, to answer your question, how do how we test um, having a cell certain certain ability to form a hierarchy and, and to form beliefs, we have to understand of how much pushback can it can it give you, can it give to the environment over over long times. And so the way I would probe this hypothetical cyborg or, or tadpole in terms of like what kind of um, expectations, what kind of planning is it is it doing, is you have to really see how these different parts of that generative hierarchical model are interacting. So you will have a you have a quick first response, which could be you know purely physical, but then very often on it turns very active in most biological system. That's the, the active inference part is really what makes life life tick. You know, it's it is mm. entirely active and it's active very quickly, but also over long time scales. And so, um, what we're trying to show in this one paper about the molecular cognition of Chris Fields and Mike was that that's a drive that got selected for very early on in, in evolution. And so. The way to probe the system is really looking, having different reporters um, genetically, but also just having certain dyes in a system that will give you readouts of its its active states. Like, what is it making? What kind of policies is it making? Is it changing its later potential? And then you try to relate those things. Are they completely independent? Are they just, you know, in a, in a non non living system? You'd expect those to be pretty pretty static with certain very predictable dynamic um, reoccurrences of patterns. But in a living system, they're going to change, and they're going to change dependently on the scale. So one scale is going to affect the other one, mm. and it's going to continue to doing that. And that's, I think, how the planning is achieved by that temporal in, uh, independent, not inter interdependence between those different aspects of a cell. If they were independent, there would be no planning. But if they're dependent on each other, then the cell is basically going to be using its long-term processes to redirect and inform its, its active points at any moment in time. Nice. Yeah, 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 and speaks to a kind of almost predictive coding hierarchy um, where you have these kind of trickle down predictions. Mike, did you want to add? Yeah, just I just want to go back for a second to something you said before, which I think is quite interesting um, about the uh, the you know the the, the non metaphorical nature of our phenomenal experience. And I, I I I take your point, and I think phenomenal experience is really important. But but there's the, there's the issue that we change. Right. And so and so how you inter so so I mean, for us, so let's say puberty is a is a is an example, right, where where a lot of valence changes and things that you thought were really important suddenly not important at all. But all this other stuff is now important. And and the the example that I really find uh, kind of uh, in, meaningful for all this is the uh, caterpillar to butterfly transition. So what happens there is you've got this you've got this soft bodied creature that has a that lives in a two dimensional world. And it crawls around and it has a particular controller for that kind of soft body you know, actuation. So it's got a certain kind of brain. And then it has to be transformed into a completely different creature that's a hard body kind of vehicle. It flies, it lives in a three-dimensional world and so on. And so, so it has a completely different brain. And during that, that process, the brain is basically mostly broken down. Most of the cells are killed off um, and then reassembled. You know, it, grows, it grows a new brain. So, so there's a, this sort of three levels of interesting things here. The, the, the first level is that, that, that aspect of phenomenal experience, like what's it, never mind what's it like to be a butterfly, but what's it like to be a caterpillar becoming a butterfly and how much of the, right, and how much of the, um, the metaphors, the, the, how, how much of the things that the caterpillar took very seriously, the butterfly thinks were total metaphors at this point, right? If it could, I mean, I'm not saying that's how it thinks about these things, but, but right, th th things that were quite, um, quite concrete for the, for, the, for the caterpillar are no longer so for the butterfly. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, we know there's continuity. So, you know, if you, if you like um, the stability of memories as a criterion for selfhood, which a lot of philosophers like, uh, we know that the butterfly remembers things that the caterpillar learned. So there is some continuity here, even though the, the brain, the cognitive system and the body of all of that stuff is radically changed, but there's some continuity. And so the next kind of question you think about is, okay, where the heck is this memory where, when the, that survives total brain re, you know, refactoring. But the third, the third thing that I find even, even more important about all of this is, is for, comes from the simple fact that, um, 
the way the way the way they test these memories is uh, well one one way to do it is you um, you you feed the caterpillar leaves on a particular color disc. And then what you find is that the, the, the so it forms the association, and then you find that the butterfly goes back to that disc to feed, right? But the but the key the key thing here is that f butterflies and caterpillars don't eat the same stuff, right? The caterpillar eats leaves. The butterfly doesn't care about leaves. The butterfly wants nectar. So um, so now something very important: you cannot just you know persistence of uh, of of the self in terms of memories. What you can't do is just keep the memories constant because you'll lose the salience. They make no sense to the, those memories. Will make no sense to the butterfly. And in fact, what you have to do is something very interesting. You can't learn leaves on this color. You have to generalize to the to the to the higher category of food. And so, right? And 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 then you have to remap. So this is the part that I'm super interested about in terms of. Uh, moving memories around and, and and transplants of memories and you know personal identity and all that you have to take the the deep lessons of your past life and sort of re uh, reinterpret them for your new life which is by the way a completely different uh, anatomy and all of that but there are some things you learn that are still pretty useful just not exactly in the way right it's not the it's not the details that that matter now it's the kind of the generic concept that matters so so re, remapping right remapping that information onto a new onto a, a, a new um embodiment for 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 that for that being I, th that's that's why i think the concept of metaphors is still super strong even for the phenomenal stuff because because you can't take any of it literally because you're not going to be the same later i mean you know as, as certainly for some animals it's more than more that so than others but you you have to understand the deep metaphor of what you learn not the not the specific details of your experience yes but yes that's really good that's really nice there's a lot there um, yeah, it, again, it's converging with some of the stuff that I've been thinking about and writing a little bit in draft, which is I'm kind of, I'm coming to this idea that the self in some ways is a, is a relevance filter, a salience filter mm. such that, cause I think at a very deep phenomenal level, everything that finds its way into attention or awareness is relevant. It wouldn't really make sense. And so I, f I would say that the one non-metaphorical thing there, although you have the higher order concept of food is relevance and relevant and, and meaning making to me and maybe well i i it's interesting you say you know we, we're trying to go up in abstraction up the generative hierarchy the one thing that the butterfly and the caterpillar share is the imperative for nutrition and maybe that's maybe so when we can start linking things in some kind of map of similarity maybe the thing that unifies them is preferences um so the caterpillar, and, the, and, and that maybe links us with the caterpillar and the butterfly, right? We have this unified um, goal. That said, the thing you said about the fact that they return to the same kind of leaf is very interesting because there does seem to be a idiosyncratic maintenance of memory, uh, which I can't quite account for. A, it, it made me think of Andy Clark's paper, um, Knitting Your Own Markov Blanket, where he talks about the um, metamorphosis of Markov blankets and how we can kind of get around this problem of like when is one thing another thing by adopting a process ontology rather than a substance ontology. But friends I, or Mike, I, 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 you know, whoever's got an idea on this, in, is, it, is it possible that it's just a false move to say that the butterfly and the caterpillar are the same thing? Like that's the same organism. Could we not just say that, you know, there actually does become this division or this separation at, and we, it's philosophically vague as to when it happens. But there are, you know, there was one thing, and there now is another. So, so, so I think the way uh, the the way to avoid these kind of philosophical traps is by being very practical and asking, uh, why, why do you need to know? So, so if the right, so so if the reason you need to know is is because you want to predict how much crawling around there's going to be, then it's absolutely two different things because there's going to be zero crawling around afterwards. But if but if what you need, but if what you're trying to predict is, um, so what color substrate will it like to feed on? Then, 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 then you need to understand that it's the same thing because you will have l less predictive power if you don't understand that it keeps memories. So it's just again, I think we're back to again the 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 um the perspective of of uh you know what what question are you asking as the observer? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Let's let's park that there. I think something that you've worked on, Mike, but also Franz, you mentioned, and I want to pick up on is the difference between neural and non-neural structures. Um, there's a there's a kind of neural bias in psychology, neuroscience, a cortico bias. Um, Franz, one, why is that the case? 
do you think? And two, why should it not be the case? If it should be the case, maybe it should be the case. Yeah. I mean, one, uh, we're, we're human centric because we are humans, but more, more fundamentally, the reason that's that, that we, we are so confined on the idea of, of neural circuits being the only one that are doing any inference is because it is very fast, right? Action potentials are fast. It's a highly optimal, optimized network. But optimized from what, right? Neurons didn't come from nothing. Uh, action potentials didn't come from nothing. Electric potentials were, were being used by cells way before the, uh, the innovation of, of neurons. So that is, I think, the reason why now we're trying to look at what about in neural organisms and just cells of, of having these same properties. Um, and more, and I think other than just that being kind of transition, what's also really interesting is Mike and I both, have, it's one of my favorite um, past <laughs> daytime activities is asking neuroscientists what, what about your theory is specific to, to neurons. And it's a question that none of us has have, have gotten a good answer to yet. Because a lot of it, of course, so, you know, there are certain certain time periods it takes. If you're looking at fMRI imaging, you're looking at the, the oxygenated blood flow in the brain. So you have to know those those time cons and how fast does it take. If you're looking at if you're actually measuring actually measuring the neuron, you need to know all these transition times to really make your model tick. But if you change those time constants and you're you're compensated for that in your model, it would still work. So as far as we know, um, so far, and we're happy to get, get proven wrong on here. But so as far as we know, there's nothing that specific about neurons to that you need to make any of those models, including artificial inference, actually work. They are highly optimized and they have completely different behaviors, of course, um, because those timings do matter, but they're not necessary for it because they're not necessary. They're not in the active inference framework, right? It's not necessary to have a brain to have a Markov blanket. It's not yeah. necessary to have a brain to have a generative model. So once all the actual assumptions that go into a model can be applied to any row systems, then you're good to go and you should apply it to those systems as well. Yeah, I guess another biased mapping here is between cognition and the brain. Um, and there's, I feel like there's been a, a, you know, a movement towards, obviously in terms of embodied cognition and the kind of the agent arena dynamic that was happening, but also more recently, Mike, your paper with Anna, Anna Chalnica, uh, the brain is not mental. You sort of, I think you look at the immune system and sort of say how the immune system contributes as well as the neural system in subserving um, adaptive control, self-organization. Perhaps you could just speak to that and and say, you know, you know well, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, I guess it's a thought experiment. What would it look like if we didn't have the immune system, if we were just trying to self-organize purely in terms of neural dynamics? Yeah, um, I, I mean, we certainly there are uh, there are knockout mice the where the immune system is taken out and all that kind of stuff. So and 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 a lot of self organization does happen before the immune system kicks in. I think you know I, I think the idea is, is simply that uh, there are many many different kinds of systems that go into this collective that uh, that we see when we say it's a, it's, a, it's a human or whatever, or whatever and and all of them uh, are potentially important contributors to the to the process um, as as Franz said you know uh, it's 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 a really interesting experience to uh, to ask people what a neuron is and 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 watch them list things that are basically every cell in the body does this and and then and then you know so so I, I have another thought experiment that I sometimes do is like like back in the um you know, back in the day when uh, when when the idea of neural networks was first being worked out, right? Um, I wonder if 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 we had come along to uh, to some of the some of the greats uh, in that uh, in that field, um, and we said, uh, oh, by the way, just just FYI, um, the biologist got it wrong. Thinking is in the liver, not the brain. So so there's two there's two ways they could have gone, right? One way is they could have said. I don't care what you say. We've got models of cognition, and they require it to be to be neural. So you guys must be wrong. Or they could say, "Fine, what do we care? Are, are this what the, you know the, the the basic calculus of you know McCulloch pits and all that stuff? The, the the basic calculus of it doesn't require doesn't care what it is. So fine, it'll be liver, right? So so I, I tend to think it would be I tend to think it would be the latter. You know, I don't see really anything in the in the deep in the deep um, lessons of um, uh, behavioral neuroscience that's really about neurons per se. You know, it's about multi-scale control. It's about active inference. It's about all these kind of deep things that go far beyond brains and they're applicable to all sorts of stuff. Stuff. But are there certain processes which are reserved for the brain? I mean, I think someone listening to this, probably a psychologist or a neuroscientist, will say, well, take the brain out, good luck. 
take the liver out, you know, I mean, still good luck, but you might have a better chance thinking, right? Uh, for for a short amount of time, I mean, take the take the mitochondria out, and uh, and and you're done for pretty much at the same rate uh, as as the brain. Now, look, the the bottom line, like I, the, nobody's arguing that the brain isn't unique and interesting in certain ways, right? Like we found, you know, as much as we find uh, protocognitive capacities elsewhere. I've never made the claim that language or long term planning is in there. Like we've not found it could be, you know, I wouldn't be terribly shocked if it were found, but, but we haven't found it. So we don't make the claim. So clearly brains are interesting and they do, they do interesting things. But um, I think it's important to uh, d- make it, make a distinction between, between having found unique features and told a very specific predictive story that, that w- of why that is, Versus just this generic gut feeling that everybody has that that I have real, you know, real feelings and plans. And this thing is a slime mold. And I mean, I don't know how many times people have said to me, well, that's a slime mold. That's not a real decision. It's just physics. And and it just, I mean, it drives me up a wall because, well, what do you, I mean, you don't think we could tell a physics story about you? Like, of course we could. It, it, it wouldn't be a very good story, but, th- but neither is it about the slime mold. And the fact that you can tell that story doesn't mean anything. There's always a physics story to be told about anything. And so, I, you're right, I think, I think it's, it's fine to have specific theories about what it is the brain that's doing differently than other structures. That's great. Um, but a lot of the resistance to the kind of continuum views that, that Franz and I are talking about comes from a kind of closet dualism. It's people really, you know, they just really feel they're different and, and, and they have to accept the fact that the physics are not different. So, well, now what is it then, right? It's like this, then, then there's something else. And I think not, not even that I'm particularly against that. I just think it should be like, come, you know, dragged out into the light. And let's just say, like, say what you think the difference is. You know, I think, I think that's really critical. See, I'm not sure the difference, I'm not sure the dualism really fundamentally is a uh, brain body dualism. I think it's an awareness body dualism or consciousness. I mean, like a traditional Cartesian dualism, I think is really at play here. It's just we're, we've been persuaded that consciousness is rooted in the brain. And so once you make that association, then you go, well, obviously my brain is special because it generates consciousness. Consciousness is special. I can in principle imagine myself being conscious without my liver, my leg, my arm, and so on. And so that's the special part. Yeah. Is Am I, what am I missing there? No, I th- I think you're right, but but I think I think I think what people are missing there is when they say conscious of my liver, that isn't that isn't the question here. The question so so right now your left hemisphere and my left hemisphere are having a delightful discussion about why lang- you know why consciousness is in the brain and uh, and and how important uh, the brain is for for consciousness. That's fine. I, th- then I will say to, and, and I don't have a new theory of consciousness, by the way. So I'm not like I usually don't talk about consciousness at all. But but since we're here, I'll I'll just say that um, I I have said that for the same reasons we think that the brain can support consciousness, we ought to take seriously that other parts of bodies also support consciousness. Now at that point, people say exactly what what you just said, which is, well, I, I don't feel like my liver is conscious, but that's a huge mistake. Of course you don't, but you also don't feel that I'm conscious, right? That that. that that's 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 exactly right. So 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 it's nice that the left hemisphere is eloquent and it has language and it can tell stories to to other left hemispheres about how how you know how conscious it is. But that doesn't mean that what you don't have spread throughout different regions of your body is a non-verbal, non-linguistic uh, consciousness that is not for us to access any more than we can access each other's. And that's that's the th- you know the fact that you don't feel it is no surprise uh, there's no surprise there um it, you have to take its perspective and ask what do you think that's going on in your brain and so so literally um uh, a, a student and i have have been uh, we have this um we have this table that that has rows for the main theories of consciousness and for each theory there is something specific, you know, so, so, so Stu Hameroff will say it's microtubules. Somebody else will say it's, you know, my electromagnetic field. Somebody else will say it's, you know, integrated information, like what, whatever it is. They, and then, and then we just look and say, okay, given that, wh- where does that occur in the body? And the answer for almost all of them is everywhere. And so n- n- none of these theories, as far as I can tell, dis- can distinguish, you know, uh, and then, and, and some of them try to rescue it. So, right. So, so IAT has this postulate that says, Okay, but 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 there's all this. We're just going to say there's only one, right? That that's 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 a 
postulate you sort of add on to things, right? That's not so. So that's that's the issue is that it's not about you feeling your your liver being conscious. It's the first person perspective, which may or may not be there. Yeah, there's plenty of that. I actually, yeah, I, I'm reticent to dive into consciousness because all my podcasts end up being about consciousness. Um, and I'm a biologist, so I don't want to, you know. But yeah, it's 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 interesting. I mean, obviously, a lot of this is being we have to take as a kind of um, axiom that at least for this conversation, that consciousness is uh, well generated in the brain, whether that's in a property dualist or whether it's in a reductive way. And I also do just want to give a shout out to slightly more esoteric forms of idealism conscious realism and mm-hmm. so on mm-hmm. but it also makes me think about let's if we just get away from consciousness in terms of first person perspective and just talk about basal intelligence in 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 terms of morphogenesis it also makes me think well it's, a, it's a, this is a term for consciousness but people will talk about being whether conscious can be is multiply realizable has multiple realizability i.e if i put you know uh, you know chi- you know if i had a chinese nation that blocks idea with exactly the same functions as my brain exactly the same synapses because there's the same you know those connections would be the same between the members of the chinese populace and my brain would i have consciousness okay if we get away from consciousness i guess my question is is morphogenesis itself can it be is it multiply realizable in the sense that we're now talking less about the human body is there something sort of or uh, and more towards like cyborgs or robots what you know people have this intuition i think as well that there is a life force an elan vital that leads maybe to this self-organization right there's like there's got to be something there like or else why why are these things resisting entropy why are they self-organizing and i think the idea is like well if i just stuck some start of priors in a robot why on earth would that end up being self like why would that work to use very reductive language friends i'm just curious is there like an added ingredient at least it might be a metaphor, but an added ingredient that we have to put into a non-carbon based thing in this case to, to give it the chance to self-organize. Yeah, probably I would if I had to name would be evolvability. Um, that would be one, one part. So if, uh, if the, and it doesn't have to be evolution of, of its actual physical components that can be evolution of its, of its programming as well, but that would be an important, important point to it. Um, the one thing I like to point out and for that question is, right, I, I've talked a lot about in this podcast about one of, my, one of my biggest interests is really understanding of where that drive for, for an agency comes from. Mm-hmm. But that's not just a kind of a philosophical um, interest kind of. It's actually really once you, once you find sufficient evidence for that being a fundamental drive in evolution, then you have to accept the the to combine that fact with the idea that, well, if any part of your body or any any robot um, that you're putting into this is going to strive to maximize its, its agency with respect to its environment, that is the real reason why, if it turns out that liver is not conscious um, right now, then the answer would be, if you accept the fact that, well, the drive is fundamentally an evolution and any life system is going to try to maximize its predictability and its agency over its environment, and the answer would be, well, its environment isn't very interesting, so the liver probably didn't have any any reason to maximize that drive. If you were to put the liver in, in or you were to put a robot into an environment that's very active, very much changing, very volatile, and you give it enough, either enough time to evolve, if you combine it to vulnerability, or you just put in um, a, a high degree of autonomy over its own beliefs, then over time with that drive, it should be able to to, to maximize that. The problem right now is that the way we program robots is uh, is very much right. It's a, it's a very clear algorithm. We don't allow really any, any adaptiveness to it. Um, and so that's that's how you would have to go about it, I think. And you may not want to do that, <laughs> just FYI, but <laughs> because the problem right, is, um, you know, we talk about one of my favorite um, uh, examples of why, what difference between machines and, and, and the brain is that a calculator it's infinitely better than you at calculating, you know, adding numbers together, multiplying is, I mean, you know, and it's the dumbest thing ever. Like it's so simple and we've had these things for, for decades now. But if you, so if you want to have a predictable, reliable answer, it's always correct. You know, the, the human is not the best, mm. best way to do this. That is the reason why we're not, even if we had the theoretical framework to make a really generative um, intelligent system, um, for what we want them to do, which is really make, make our lives easier, but make the same thing every day reliably, you wouldn't want to do that. But yeah. if your goal was to create a new uh, intelligent um, um, 
cognitive agent, then you would have to go about it differently. Yes, that's an interesting little paradox, isn't it? I mean, like the most robust thing in the world might be a calculator, but it's it's also inc- quite useless. It's like the more useful you become, the more uh, precarious your existence is. Um, Mike, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that kind of multiple realizability question. And I guess what I'm going at with that is, it's a very, it's a, it is a philosophical question, but I think it's interesting for biologists, which is why would evolution, like, why would evolution prioritize self-organization? I mean, there's just a fundamental question there in terms of entropy. I mean, why do we have these pockets of neg entropy entities? Um, is there a biological answer to that beyond just well? to be a biological entity you are neg entropy is, is there anything can we get anywhere beyond that yeah um a couple of couple of things i think are interesting and i want to be careful here because i i did i did a little while ago i did um i started writing a paper on what exactly is missing from our technology to provide true agency because i think we can actually say what some of those things are and it, it quickly sort of dawned on me that to whatever extent i was onto something that would actually lead to a, a massive creation of of new beings that that matter in the moral sense, and I, I'm not too interested in in you know um, being responsible for that. So I, some other people will do it, I'm sure, but but but, but I don't I don't want to do it. So 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 um, but but I can but I can say a few things. Um, I think I think uh, when we I, I, I when when we make the distinction between life and robotics. Um, even aside from all the hybrids and cyborgs that, that show us that it's like a continuum, but even aside from all that, when we make that distinction, here, here's what I hear. I think life is what we call things that are good at scaling up uh, goals. So, so you, you know, when you have very, when, when you have a bunch of subunits that have very basal competencies, you know, may, maybe all they can do is follow least action laws or like, like really simple things. When 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 you've got a pile of them and the pile has basically exactly the same cognitive lycone as the comp- the components, we say, well, that's not living. That's a rock. That's just you know. But 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 life is what we what we call things where there are um, special. I, I've also called it a cognitive glue. There are like these special policies by which the parts relate to each other, such that the collective has a bigger cognitive lycone in new spaces that the parts couldn't have. And that's and that's what we call life. Now now. Under that, under that way of thinking about it, could you make that out of other things? I'm sure you could, and, I, and you know, I tend to think that in the wide universe, I tend to think that there's probably lots of extremely diverse examples, some most of which we wouldn't even recognize, of 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 that happening. And I think um, specifically, I think I think what happens is that uh, the the evolutionary process really. It, I, I don't really think it makes specific solutions to specific problems the way that we do when we do genetic algorithms and things like this. I think what, what biological evolution does is it makes problem solving machines. And that's because if you overtrain on your evolutionary priors and you really take seriously uh, what expectations that you might have about what genes you have, what the environment is like, if you take that too seriously, you're done for. Because, because guaranteed, and this is why I also think that regeneration is not really about repair of, um, of physical damage, like, like external damage. I think fundamentally, regeneration is about knowing for a fact that your own parts are going to change, right? Ev- evolution just means the fact that you have a, so some kind of a lineage that's subject to mutation, whatever. You, you know your stuff is going to change. If you don't accept that, you're, you're never going to survive long term. So, so what ends up surviving are architectures that in particular are these multi-scale architectures where the individual components have agendas and then this, you know, they, they, they make up systems that have other agendas and, and, and on and on. Our, our current robotics by and large is very flat. Right. So you hope your robot is intelligent, but the but the parts it's made of are not. They don't really tend to do anything on. They don't have their own agendas. And I've given a talk called the why robots don't get cancer. And this is why. Right. It's because you they, they're made of parts that are not they that don't have their own little little goals in other spaces. And there's no danger of them defecting, unlike biology, where it happens all the time. So um, I think what's I think what's happening here is that we end up with these architectures that uh, are by virtue of cooperation and competition of parts that that end up being uh, being having a, co- a larger cognitive lycone, you end up with this kind of 
this, this kind of intelligence ratchet. And we could, you know, I could, I could tell you stories about how that, that type of thinking explains, you know, planarian, uh, the, the amazing facts of planarian regeneration and so on. This, this, this idea that what evolution I think really so, selects for is the plasticity to, and, 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 and it works out in different types of animals to different degrees, but, but overall the plasticity to deal with novelty, you know, this idea that when you, when you emerge into the, uh, into the world, you don't know for a fact what you are, what you have. Is your genome the same as it was? Are your cells the right shape or size? Do you have, yeah, are you in the same environment? You don't know any of these things. You, you have to um, do your best in putting together a model of what, that, that, that's why life is so interoperable. That's why we can make anthrobots and xenobots and interface living tissue with crazy nanomaterials and make these hybrids that are you know, just sort of totally cobbled together. It's because by and large, it, it's already bought into, you know, the, the life we see today has already bought into the fact that, um, like, like, you know, everything changes, you know, and you do, and you can't, you can't depend on these things. You have to figure them out in real time. Yeah. Yeah. Great. It, you know, when you mentioned the word cognitive glue, it made me realize that there's one thing that we haven't even touched upon at all. I haven't even mentioned, which is electricity and bioelectricity. Um, so I think actually you had the paper, Mike, didn't you, last year, two years ago, um, about bioelectricity being the glue of the cognitive mind, sort of from physiology all the way up to the mind. And obviously this is very much, you know, uh, a seminal piece of your work is the processes of bio bioelectrical processes in cells and outside of cells and in terms of self-organization. And I think, at least to my very layman biological ears, electricity almost has the the kind of center of a elan, elan vital a kind of thing that, you know, animates things. And maybe, you know, I'm thinking about Frankenstein. Um, either one of you, I don't mind whoever wants to start. What, you know, actually, Franz, it was something that you mentioned, which is maybe one of these ways that we can conflate the neural, non-neural divide is the fact that both of them have, both of them are fundamentally electrical. What What is it about that electrical ontology that animates or might animate intelligence or morphogenesis mm -hmm. so when i was writing my, my phd thesis i was trying to answer in the introduction the question of where does where does a neuron even come from and the, the best paper i found that was answering that question was looking into this very small organism that had just a bunch of little cilia around its surface and it was a marine organism that was living on the bottom of the ocean and it was trying to send its environment and it could do by small changes in electrical fields that they were happening around it and that was causing um like mini I won't say actual potential, but it was causing basically many vibrations and could use that to change to change its movement. So the reason I think why that would you know why the electricity is that so important here is just very it's a very simple mechanism to have that is physically a lot more accessible to all parts of the body. And that's actually the primary reason why I joined Mike's lab and why I'm I've become a biologist. I was a physicist before, so I was looking for something in biology that would be all these that would not be subject to completely different mechanisms if you switch organisms. So like the molecular pathways we are typically investigating as well as antibiologists, they are, of course, as, as they were before, they are now still very important and they're directing all these different functions of the cell and organisms. But they're kind of somewhat unsatisfactory for a physicist because it's just so messy, right? You can't really make heads or tails of it. And there is no clear field of potential that is, is just one number, essentially, right? You want to reduce it to something very simple. The beauty of using biotricity is that you can you can have one number, one like potential that you can uh, like a memory potential that you can describe to a cell. It's still made up of all the individual parts. There's many iron channels involved in this. All the molecular pathways are still making up. They're all feeding into that one um, one number, that one memory potential. But what's more interesting is the readout part, right? You still if you have to constantly compare the millions of different molecules in a cell, that's not going to be good good formulation for, for achieving consciousness, for even doing any smart behavior. Having something that you can constantly, constantly having a surface, almost like a space that you can read and that can write onto and read out to. I think that was makes electric potentials so appealing that the only question then is like, why wasn't it other physical fields like mechanics? They are, of course, uh, uh, very involved as well in developmental biology and regeneration as well. But mechanics don't have this neat feature where it's not as, as fast and it's not as localized. So basically, the way I see it, the potentials have a, have a beautiful trade-off between being physical, having a broad readability on a, on a cell or even a, a tissue level, 
but are confined enough that they can be modulated enough to actually form active behavior, which you can't say for um, most of the, for the other physical fields that we would um, think about in this context. Great. Mike, you want, yeah. anything you want to add? Yeah. Yeah, a couple, a couple of things. One, one thing to add is that if, if you think about um, what, one of the really powerful things about um, bioelectricity is that Im imagine an ion channel, specifically a voltage sensitive ion channel. So as soon as evolution discovers a voltage sensitive ion channel, what you have there is an element with historicity. It means that uh, the current state is a function of what was going on before. And it means that what you really have is a voltage gated current conductance, AKA a transistor. And so, 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 you, you know, we know once you have that, then, then you can do anything. And so, uh, electricity is, is really good for these kinds of feedback loops, right? Both positive and negative. It's good for, um, representing information across time and space. It's good for functionally integrating a system, uh, across across distance some some of the um really cool early uh, evolutionary data on this come from bacterial biofilms and this is um Gorol Swell's amazing work uh what basically he's he's got a, a paper called um you know brain like signaling in bacterial biofilms and the idea is that already in a in a mat of bacteria so like a really long time ago um evolution already uh hit on to this uh to this idea that um by using electrical uh, electrical signaling to integrate activity among competent subunits, you can get gains at the collective level. So they take turns. It's used for for nutrient sharing and and, and things like this. But but you get these collective dynamics. And so I think it's just it, it's a very convenient modality for it that was that was found a long time long before neurons you know picked it up. Um, it was used for that kind of thing. But but no doubt there are other there are other ways to do it. Somewhere out in the universe there are, there are, there's other. I'm sure I'm sure there are other kinds of cognitive of glues out there but but here electricity works really well cool and so i know we need to wrap up relatively soon um and i guess uh, it's, it's a it's a kind of dark pun but us wrapping up kind of soon makes me think about aging and death and decay and, and whatnot and there's a there's a massive fuss about aging and longevity at the moment um and david sinclair and this notion of epigenetic scratches and it kind of makes me think of the inverse of that, which might be regenerative biology and the capacity to reestablish self-organization, reestablish uh, the kind of priors that we've been discussing in terms of the functional priors, the, the preference priors, the ones that you know are seeking a certain sort of uh, external state or seeking a certain probability distribution so as to be able to fulfill its function, so to speak. Um, what, Mike, what is the kind of lay of the land in your world as to aging um how seriously should we take this kind of epigenetic approach i won't ask about the moral aspect of it because it's a completely different question about whether we should live longer or not but sure you know having localized uh, morphogenesis and self-organization is really the currency of biological systems how viable is it that we can re-establish that in something which is you know where self-organization is ailing and and rather feeble yeah um i think well the, f the first thing is uh, i i do just want to say something about the moral question because it also gets to the issue of regenerative medicine more broadly uh and uh and and beyond regenerative medicine human augmentation and all of these kinds of things so, so the one the one the one thing i want to uh point out is uh if it were the case that we were in some way optimized by some intelligence that shared our values, then one could make the argument, hey, let, let's not push too far off of that, right? You're, you're screwing up the plan. And, and I get a lot of these emails from people saying, uh, well, well, well th things are great, you, better, you know, you scientists better not mess it up. And I just want to be clear that I, there, there is no basis for, 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 this, for this view. We, our, our life, our health span, our aging, our susceptibility to, to all kinds of dumb diseases and our lower back pain and astigmatism, all this, all this stuff is, is not in any way uh, optimized for any of the things we care about. That's just where evolution happens to have dropped us off at this point. That's, that's it. And so there's nothing magical about this lifespan. If, if, if you, do, you know, people who are worried about um, uh, augmenting this lifespan well, what if it had been 20 or 30, 
you know, then what? And you say, well, you know, that's too short. Well, why is that too short? It could have been anything. It's but my point is it's completely arbitrary. And so, and so let's not um, base our uh, decisions about what, um, what ought to be on where the process of random mutation and selection has, has dumped us. So that's the, you know, I, I kind of, I think that's important to say um, be, be beyond that. I mean, we're certainly involved in uh, some some uh, some research on aging and the role of bioelectricity in aging and kind of the uh, uh, the degradation of bioelectric patterning information with age and all that. But I think more importantly is the my my weather vane for all of this stuff is planaria. So so I think you know planaria basically I think hold hold the answer to all of life's uh, big questions. And so uh, I mean pl the, the the asexual form of um, planaria that we have. They do not age. They, they, they. There is no, there is no evidence of an old planarian. They simply, they, they can go forever. So these ideas that it's some sort of inevitable accumulation of errors, or it's telomeres, or it's, uh, you know, uh, clearly there are ways around it. That's the one thing that's we, we have an existence proof uh, that, uh, and then there's a few other animals that do it, but planaria I think are, are the most interesting. Uh, there, there, there is obviously a strategy that gets around it. And I think it's on us to figure out why that is. And I think it's absolutely not a coincidence that planaria are also extremely regenerative. In addition to being immortal, they're extremely regenerative, they're cancer resistant, and they have an incredibly noisy genome. Because they don't clean their genome in every generation like we do, they, they right, somatic mutations just, if, you, if it doesn't kill the cell, it just basically expands into the next generation. Planaria can be mixoploid. Every cell could have a different number of chromosomes. They're just a complete mess. And, and those are the animals that are that are highly regenerative, cancer resistant and immortal. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that right? It, it, yeah. And, and so the, there's a, so so finally, after after years of being like feeling scandalized about this, uh, you know, the importance of the genome and all that. And, if, and, and why is the animal with the with the craziest genome also have all these amazing capacities? Um, I think we actually finally have have a, a lead on, on what's going on there. But um, but I think I think that's that's what we need to look at in terms of aging. Is 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 I, th I think if regenerative if the if the question of regenerative medicine were solved, aging would be solved as a byproduct. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think. Um, in some ways, I, I don't know about the the function of planaria. Um, you know, they're sort of these worms. People can search up pictures of planaria, um, but it makes me think that they like the in many ways the let's just take ourselves for example. What makes a human a human? is in some ways the fact that the the preference priors that we have or our limited functionality our functionality is limited right like i am not going to be at 39 38 37 and 36 degrees centigrade with equal probability but it sounds to me like planaria are able to sort of metamorphosize in some ways some of their preferences because as you say their genome is shaping is that is that kind of a misconstrual of what's going on is it that with or that with the sort of multi, the the multiplicity of the genome, the messy genome comes a multitude of function, or is it that the function is still constrained? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give you uh, and 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 unfortunately I have to we have to run in a couple of minutes, but I'll just give you a very quick uh, story of what I think is going on in Planaria. Uh, I think uh, and and this is um this is Steve Steve Frank uh, told me an interesting uh, analogy to this. Apparently, uh, you know when when RAID arrays became popular, right? So computer um, computer disks that are that makes it make copies of themselves so that you know if something goes wrong. He basically said that when RAID arrays became popular, the quality of disk media went down. Because it wasn't as important anymore to have to have your hardware be super reliable because you've got this this uh, the system on top of it. I think what what's happened in Planary in that lineage is that it has uh, really uh, come to grips with the fact that the hardware might be junk, and that all the evolutionary effort went into cranking the algorithm. Basically, the idea that we, we're going to assume from the beginning that you're full of mutations, you're unre it's it's unreliable hardware, and we're going to assume it's unreliable. And so what we're going to do is do our best to uh, have a system that is so highly regenerative that no matter what's going on, we can we have stand a pretty good chance of making a good planarian. The, the, the development of planaria is it's, it's called a chaotic mode where it's a total mess and then it sorts itself out into a proper worm. Um, I think, uh, and, and, and here's why I think it happened and, and we have computational models that show, that show how this works. It, imagine that uh, you, you have a 
certain competencies to fix defects. For example, like in the frog, we know that if, if the mouth has moved off a little bit in development, it'll soon make its way back to where it needs to be. It sort of fixed, it fixes itself. So, so in evolution, if you have a system that has a little bit of competency to fix itself, when that individual comes up for selection, and selection sees that, uh, okay, this is a great individual. What selection doesn't know is, is it great because the genome was amazing or is it great because the genome was actually so-so, but it fixed itself. You, you don't know. Once you don't know, you're, it becomes really difficult to reward for the best genomes. What you can reward is for the best phenotypic fitness, for the best outcomes. And as soon as you do that, that makes the problem worse because then the competency goes up, then it, then it becomes even harder to know what your genome was. So, so, you, so you start off with this ratchet, with this positive feedback loop. And I think in planaria, it went all the way and in other species, not so far. And in some like C. elegans, maybe not at all. But, but, but that, that idea that, that the, the more competency of, of um, uh, kind of uh, uh, reparative, regenerative developmental process it, 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 you, can, you can eventually, if you take it to its logical conclusion, you can say, fine, we're going to assume that the, that the structural genome is going to be all kinds of noise, and we're going to come up with an algorithm that can keep it clean, keep the, the morphology clean, assuming that, that's, assuming that that's the case. And I think Planaria just like cranked that knob all the way, and salamanders sort of do it, and, and, you know, and, and maybe nematodes don't do it much. That is very, very cool. It makes me want to be a biologist because it. The question, if we had more time, and I know we don't, is well, where on earth is that regenerative mechanism coming from if it's not encoded in the genome somewhere? But we won't go into it. It just sounds to me like there are other ways to maximize model evidence to use these active influence words to maximize model evidence or to return to an attractor state beyond genomic stability, and that's really fascinating because I think people think well, the the priors, the so called phenotypic priors, are just what evolution has endowed us in terms of our DNA. Yeah. And, 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 and so if we wanted to have another discussion, this is where we would talk about xenobots and anthrobots and these things that have never been under selection at the organism level, you know, in the history. Uh, I mean, I, I've also been, I'll finish up here, but I've been reading a little bit of Evan Thompson in, in Mind and Life, and he talks about how, well, the, the autopoetic coupled system is not going, you can't discover that dynamic in the genome. Because there are things that are also selected over time, which ret which refer to the external dynamic, and which refer to the world in which we are born and thrown into, and that's really important as well. And I wonder whether what that interplay means in terms of regeneration and and morphogenesis. But as as you're all aware and I'm aware, we're limited in time, so we should. I, I'd absolutely love to do this again. I mean, it was absolutely fascinating, um, guys. Thank you. Uh, just if you have a minute, it'd be great to know where people can find your details and also like what you guys have got coming up in the pipeline that people can be aware of. Franz, you want to go first? Sure. I mean, you can basically look at our names and on, you know, scroll and get some of our papers. Um, we have a great website for the Level Lab that has a bunch, bunch of our research come culminated. Um, my, uh, my papers coming up, we're actually looking at some of these questions in an annual organism in Volvox. That's going to be happening soon. I'm very excited about that. Um, because like, all, all the works published for me right now is a lot of the, the theoretical simulations and mm -hmm. you know, talking about the concepts. But I'm excited about most of my PhD work was trying to apply this to an animal organism and see whether or not there's anything there. Um, so that'll be exciting. fantastic. And Mike? Yeah, so the, so the lab website is at uh, drmike11.org, one word, drmike11.org. And so that's where all the peer-reviewed stuff, the, the papers, the protocols, um, data sets, software, everything is, is there. And then kind of uh, a little bit uh, more uh, out there, some thoughts are at a, a blog called thoughtforms.life. And that's just, my, that's just my personal one. I'll make sure everything goes in the uh, video description so people can check it out there. But guys, thank you that's again. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure.